Right, hello. Um, the latest news in radiation protection, if you like to put it like that, is the increase in thyroid cancer in the 0 to 18 year olds in um, the area around Fukushima. Uh, a study of the numbers detected by uh, ultrasound um, was, was published recently by some Japanese people in the journal Epidemiology. Now, people have argued that the numbers that they found, that's about 120 thyroid cancers in 387,000 people, uh, young people aged 0 to 18, that the number 120 was high only because of what's called detection bias. So in other words, these cancers would normally be there in a population of 0 to 18 year olds in Japan, and the only reason they found them was because they looked with uh, um, ultrasound. But in fact that's not true, because a, a control group of children aged 0 to 18 was examined by um, a different uh, number, a, a, a different uh, uh, group of people uh, in Nagasaki. And also another study was done earlier on on, on the children uh, who, who were living in the Fukushima constituency, um, and they found no thyroid cancers. So essentially we know that there are hardly any or probably zero thyroid cancers which, are, which can be detected by ultrasound in a population that hasn't been exposed to radioactivity. So what this shows is that there was an increase of um, about, um, let's see, uh, there were 120 uh, the, the, the thyroid cancers and they should have only, they, uh, and if there had been no radiation they would have only have found seven. Now on the basis of the ICRP risk model uh, and the dose that was that was calculated by the WHO, the World Health Organization, of about seven to ten millisieverts. On the basis of the of the um, ICRP model, uh, you would expect an ex, uh, an extra sixty percent uh, of thyroid cancers for every one thousand millisieverts. Anyway, so you can use that to calculate what you would have expected in this population, and it's about 0.2 of a, of a thyroid cancer in that population. And that leads you to the understanding that the error in the risk model for this particular type of cancer is about 2,600 times. It's not a small number. And there was a similar, uh, of course, uh, error factor required to explain the children's cancer around nuclear sites. And, and also the adult cancer around nuclear sites, of which I've now published three papers, one about, on Bradwell Nuclear Power Station, one on Hinkley Point, nuclear power station and one on Trisfinite nuclear power station. Wherever we look we find an excess of adult cancers um, and not just the, th the children's cancers. And there's a whole load of other evidence that suggests that the ICRP model is out by a very large amount, thousands of times. Anyway, so I was asked to go to Sweden to, 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 to um, a meeting of the Nuclear Waste Council which was held at the Swedish National Academy of Royal Academy of Sciences in Stockholm, and, and, and I went there. I was asked to go by Milkas, which is the anti-nuclear, the funded anti-nuclear organisation, opposed to the uh, repository, the proposed nuclear waste repository at Forsmark. The Swedes are, are building, or at least proposing to build. A company called SKB is proposing to build an enormous nuclear repository, uh, waste rep high-level waste repository. Uh, in, in Forsmark, which is in Ostama council area, um, up near Uppsala, uh, above, about 50 miles north of Stockholm. And so what this meeting was, was intended to do was to reassure the people who were interested in this, mainly the people who, who lived near the nuclear site and the proposed development, that the risk model of the ICRP could sh showed that the amounts of releases that were likely to occur would not hurt anybody. In other words, the doses were too low, right? But we know, or at least anybody who's listened to me for the last 25 years knows that the concept of dose doesn't work. And the latest evidence of that, of course, is the, Fukush is the Fukushima thyroid cancers. So I went along there, and although the thing was in Swedish, I hopped up and down after every single presentation asking uh, questions and, and generally making a nuisance of myself. And at the end of it all, there was a mo there was a period for discussion. 
So I kind of took over the period of, for discussion and I jumped up and I, and I presented the evidence or, you know, a brief account of the evidence that the ICRP risk model which they were using was bunk, was just nonsense for internal radionuclides. And in fact it was quite clear, and, and I, wish, I wish someone had videoed this, but they didn't, because I got up and said that the presentations from the stage by the people who were invited to make these presentations were criminally biased. I mean, they argued that there was no evidence at all, you know, they didn't, they didn't put out any evidence at all that suggested their approach was wrong. It's very wrong. People are dying as a result of this. Anyway, we can use, I said, and you will hear me because I'm going to splice this on the end of this, we said that, I said, that uh, the Basic Safety Standards Directive of the European Union uh, requires that if there's new and important evidence that emerges that the risk model is wrong, then every single practice in, in the area of radiation uh, exposure has to be re-justified. The justification means you say, hey, only, only a few cancers will, will occur after these exposures, but we're going to get an enormous benefit from it. That's what's justification, okay? I mean, there, there are actually various philosophical problems with the concept of justification anyway, since it's a, an old-fashioned type of um, philosophy uh, called utilitarianism, whereby, you know, some people get a benefit and some, some people get a disadvantage. And the question arises as to who gets the benefit and who gets the disadvantage. Anyway, we won't go there. So what I'm going to show you is, is, is a video that was taken by a friend of mine uh, on a reasonably good camera. I think someone else has already put up a, a, a version of, of, of me talking there. But, but I mean, I wanted to explain to you uh, w why I was there and what it is we propose to do. Uh, with regard to the Basic Safety Standards Directive. And, and by the way, I have to say that, that I've tried to get this Basic Safety Standards Directive approach um, operational through the European Parliament, through the Greens in the European Parliament, but they have been singularly useless. You know, I mean, well, I don't know whether they are just stupid or whether they are uh, infiltrated or whether they're key people there, you know, infiltrating it and blocking it. But the obvious way to take down the nuclear industry is through their own law, through the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which has to be applied in every single country, of course. But nobody seems to want to do it. Anyway, what I propo propose to, to do is to try and get some Swedish organisations to bring the pressure on the Swedish radiological safety outfit called SSM. And so, because that's where you have to start. You have to start in the member state country. So anybody in another member state country who wants to try this trick on well, it's not a trick, really. I mean, it's the law. Who wants to apply the law, shall we say, then get in touch with me, and I will write, I will write the, the, the legal application for them, and I will go there, someone pays my fare, if necessary, to present the evidence that the Basic Safety Standard Directive requires in order to force the re-justification of all practices involving exposures uh, of members of the public and, um, and workers. So anyway, um, you can now listen to me disrupting the meeting in Sweden. <laughs> Talk to you again. Well, I understood this not to be a question and answer session. I thought it was a discussion. And I've come a long way to, to be involved in this discussion. And to my mind, the discussion is about the accuracy of the ICRP risk model for um, analysing the effects, the health effects of radionuclides. Now in this regard, I see all the people here on the stage as cowboys and myself as an Indian. And there are some Indians in the audience, but they're not scientists mainly. So I, I think I have to lay out my stall. I've said a few things before about this, but I need to say Few more things and I won't take up too much of your time but this is to start as a discussion rather than questions to these people whose answers I could have given you all myself. Right. I'm going to start with the with the legal constraints upon Sweden that are put in place by the European Union. The European Commission radiation protection laws are based on what's called the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which originally was brought in in 1996. 
And, and one of the clauses in this safety standards directive, which is the directive which is based on the ICRP risk model, and it says that the doses can't be more than one millisievert, and it calculates the amount of exposures you can get from each radionuclide so as to not exceed this one millisievert. But one of the clauses in there says, if new and important evidence emerges as to the accuracy of the, the, the basis for the standards, and this is under Article 5, Justification, then all processes, all practices which involve the exposure of individuals to ionizing radiation have to be re-justified. That means if you find something that looks like there's a problem, the law says you have to do something about it. You have to go back and look at it again and, and figure out whether you're right or wrong. So then we have to ask ourselves, are there, is there, new and important information? Well, all of the presentations I've seen here have completely ignored all of the new and important information. Not one of these gentlemen here, and of course some of them like this nice man who talks about ethics, uh, it's not his area. But the areas of the people who should be knowing about these things are, are singularly um, focused on big doses on the doses from Hiroshima, on external doses from, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, on external doses to x-rays and hospital exposures and so forth. But there is an enormous, an enormous literature of published studies that show that internal radionuclides at very low doses, conventionally expressed, expressed by the ICRP as microsieverts, the sorts of exposures that you're going to get from force mark, that these have um, significant effects. And I'm going to just briefly go through these, because these are important and they have to be considered. Can I just ask you, do you need, maybe just mention the publications, because if you go through the whole list... No, I'll be very quick, don't okay. worry. I'm not, I don't want because to hug the it, proceedings. It, it's but better I have to, to have them in writing, though. I'm just going to put a list of them on, uh, one after another. I, I would have liked to come here and had a little to ten minutes with, with some slides, and it would have been a lot quicker, but um, I, I didn't get that opportunity, so I'm going to grasp this opportunity, if I may. The first one I've already talked about, which is the Fukushima thyroid cancers, this shows an error in the ICRP on the basis of the WHO doses of 2,000 times, right? So we're not talking about small numbers here, we're talking very big numbers. There's an error of 2,000 times. Then we're talking about uranium. Gisela Kanu has done studies of uranium workers in, uh, in Arriva, in France, published in the literature, in, in, in proper journals, which shows effects um, in the uranium workers, cancers, leukemias, heart troubles, which show an error in the risk model of about 2,000 times. Then we talk about childhood leukemia and your nuclear sites. In all of the studies that, show, that look at nuclear sites, you have increases in childhood leukemia, which show an error in the risk model of about 500 to 10,000 times. Then we've got three studies that I've done of nuclear sites, which have been published in the last six months in peer-reviewed literature, which show a doubling of breast cancer in women living close to nuclear sites or to pollution in nuclear sites in three nuclear sites in the United Kingdom, Bradwell in Essex, um, uh, Hinkley Point in Somerset, and Trasvenith in Wales. So all of these show, show effects at doses which are less than one millisievert, probably more like 100 microsieverts, 50 microsieverts, conventionally expressed. Then there's studies of sex ratio. There's a huge load of studies of, of, of children who were born after nuclear injections, like a, a fallout from the net weapons testing, um, after Chernobyl, after Fukushima, you get a, a, an alteration, an alteration in the number of boys born to the number of girls. It's a quite clear genetic effect. And then we have the problems with genetic damage. Now, as one of the gentlemen here said that the, after Hiroshima there, Hiroshima, there was no genetic damage. They couldn't find any genetic damage in children. But those studies were begun five years after the bomb. And lots of people had died in that time. So this was a, a population that they studied that began in 1950. The bomb exploded in 1945. 
So there was an enormous increase in genetic damage there, which hasn't been regular, hasn't been, hasn't entered into the, into the, into the lifespan studies. Well, those are enough. I won't go on. But what I say is this: that the, that the law requires the SSM as a national competent authority in Sweden to re-justify all of the practices involving exposure of populations. And the theoretical mechanisms that underpin this have to do with the binding of internal radionuclides to DNA. Because the risk model of the ICRP is a model involving the dilution of energy into a body which is considered to be like a sack of water. But that isn't how it works. Well, how it works is that these internal radionuclides are first and foremost, they're chemicals. And they have chemical affinity for various parts of the body, molecular parts of the body inside cells, and some of them actually have high affinity for DNA, which is the target for radiation effects. And the most important one of these is uranium, which has a massive affinity for DNA, which has been known since 1963 and is all published in the literature. And I went to Melody at the beginning of this Melody conference in Paris, and I said all this stuff then and nothing was done about it. But what is being done now is they have started to look at it. And they're going to, when are they going to finish looking at it? 2020, by which time more people will have died. So what I'm saying is that we need to go to the SSM. The, the, the organizations in Sweden who are concerned about these issues need to require the SSM to investigate all of these studies that show effects at minute doses from internal radionuclides. And I'll leave it at that. That's the discussion. So discuss away. Thank you very much okay. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Jag ska försöka inte att översätta allt som sa. Jag tror att många av er hängde med. Men det som jag ändå uppfattar som en diskussion och en, ja, något av en fråga är nu. Vad händer med enligt lagstiftning och enligt det, det vi jobbar utifrån så kommer det fram nya fakta i målet så ska man också omvärdera. Och frågan blir då, den här nya forskningen, den, den, att det finns mycket forskning Eh, hur tas den tillvara på? Har ni bevakning på den? Vad händer med det? Det, det publiceras otroligt mycket hela tiden. Men finns det en kanal in i att också omvärdera det vi vet redan idag? Då särskilt med tanke på låg, eh, låg strålning, låga doser. Vad jag förstår vad, vad liksom innebär den i det här. Är det någonting som ni bara vill ta med er eller är det någonting som ni vill kommentera? Jag tror att man ska kommentera det här så tillvida att <coughs> det produceras ju en mängd.